Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous, hosted by Bruce Hutchin. I'm so happy you joined us today, and you're going to find out a lot about whitetail hunting on the show. This is Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast, episode number 362. Today's episode of Whitetail Rendezvous was recorded live at Iowa Deer Classic 2017, and I was privileged to have Dave Holder with Raised Hunting. Now, Raised Hunting is all about hunting. This family lives, sleeps, and breathes hunting 365. And as Dave says, hey, if I'm not hunting, I'm thinking about hunting. If I'm not thinking about hunting, I'm preparing to go hunting. And if I'm not doing all those, I'm talking about hunting. Yeah, raise hunting on the My Outdoor TV channel. It's something that you need to take a look at, take a watch, and listen to all the tips and techniques they have about being raised hunting. It's never too early to think about food plots. Wait till Rendezvous has an ebook for you. Just simply text 33444 food plot to get your copy. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, Bruce Hutch, and I'm sitting at the Iowa Deer Classic, Des Moines, Iowa. And I am privileged to have as a guest today, Dave Holder from Raised Hunting. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bruce. Glad to be here. We are uh, finishing up here. We are on the third day, so we're pretty excited that uh, the attendance has been astronomical, in my opinion, for the 70-degree weather in March, which is not normal. But uh, it just shows that their hunting is alive and well, and people are here to talk about and enjoy the, um, man, you see, I, I don't know if you walked over to the big buck area. Yeah, the, incredible. The, the deer here are just ridiculous almost. So it's fun to get here at this time of year. There's not a lot going on, and we get to visit with all the people that have been watching the show and letting us know what's going on. But more importantly, seeing a lot of them and, and the things that they shot this year and and, and what hunting means to them. So it's been excellent. We've really enjoyed this show. Well, folks, and uh, as I say, real people in real places, Dave and I are sitting in a brand new 2017 68,000 Dodge. So <laughs> if you're from um, Des Moines, Iowa, you got to go visit the guys at the Dodge shop because they've been so gracious to give me a sound room for the whole show. So props to them. So, Dave, let's let's talk about getting close. I went to your seminar yesterday, and you got some pretty um, excellent, extraordinary, um, almost beyond belief. But we'll leave that um, so you can talk about that. But from ground strands, he had deer on film. How many feet away? Uh, sometimes as close as four or five, even six six yards. And so the <clears throat> one thing I liked and. I call this, uh, Dan Johnson uh, talked to me about this, is uh, run and gun. And run and gun is you see a deer, but you have to adapt to that deer. You don't leave your stand in that place, so you have to adapt. So, Dave, kind of walk us through what happened on that buck that you had on film. You know, the, the one that we talked about yesterday was with my wife, Karen, and it, I would say it was a run and gun uh, abbreviated version, and that is we had a ground blind set up in a particular spot, what happened was the, the cornfield got cut the day before. So it changed everything that we were <clears throat> intending on. We had this blind set in there for weeks, brushed in, we're ready to go. Sure enough, Karen and I get in it. We see a pile of deer the day before. Um, however, they're all behind the blind because of the corn being cut. It changed their pattern. So instead of trying to switch your blind around it, we dropped the new one in. And I mean, I had my boys were the very first ones to tell me this is never going to work. And then, of course, you tell other people, that you're going to try this. And they're like, good luck with that. Karen and I climbed into a brand new setup that we put in the night before, probably saw somewhere between 14 and 15 deer or 14 and 15 bucks could have shot probably 10 to 12 of those, but she ended up shooting a, a beautiful 150 inch deer at 12 yards only because we didn't take the shot at six. So it's, it's, you, you talk about run and gun. I talk about getting out of the box. We wouldn't nowadays we have a television show raised hunting's on the outdoor channel along with hundreds of other shows and sometimes i think people start to watch television and they think this is what, how you have to do it and what they're not seeing is the unedited version and how you got to that point and so i try to tell people don't look at what tv for us is about five minutes of five days so for every five days we spend we get five minutes of footage 
you, you don't want to get caught up in that that's the only thing we're doing. We're adapting and we're doing what we have to to put ourselves in those situations so we have something to bring people on TV. Yeah, for my fans out <clears throat> Wisconsin, Iowa, well, just about any place you've been hunting the land for 20, 30 years. I know the farm that I hunt. I hunted the first time 50 years ago. This fall will be 51 years ago. And some of the stand, wooden stands still stand. We don't hunt out of wooden stands at all. That's verbatim, not going to happen. We're trying to take them down one at a time. But because we do that, the deer pattern us. And this is a big thing that I want you to learn with this coming season. If you're hunting the same stand in the right wind, that deer, any buck within 200, 300 yards, is going to know you're there, correct? Oh, absolutely. You know, so I guess I look at those old stands two ways. One, it tells me that someone else figured this out a long time ago. I mean, I got some on my own property that the pieces are there. You see the nails and things. And I love that because that tells me those deer have been using that area for a long time. That This is a natural corridor which they want to go through. But I can't agree with Bruce more in that not necessarily do I want to be in that tree. I just want to be in that area. And so a lot of times we'll have... I have also, I didn't, I didn't show it yesterday in the, in the seminar, but I've had opportunities or situations where we've had deer that we knew they figured out where we were. They saw us or caught us moving in the tree. All we did put up another tree stand about eight or 10 yards away. And when they came in and looked up in the tree where we were supposed to be, and we weren't there, it was game over. So, I mean, don't overthink this. You, you can outwit them. You know, sometimes we didn't move to an entirely different farm because we've been busted. He didn't go anywhere. He still felt like he was comfortable and could live there. He was just going to live there with a little more knowledge. And we used his knowledge against him. And it's, it's amazing. We are hunting critters that are, you know, wired. These deer are wired. If something goes wrong, they're out of there. But if you change it up subtly and all of a sudden, just like Dave said, he looks up to where he saw you yesterday, the day before, you're gone. Stan's gone. Everything's gone. He's going to think a little bit. And he's not so quite sure because you mess with his mind a little bit. And if you're going to mess with his dear mind, then put yourself in a position to figure out where he's going to go. What's his next step? Is he going to go right, left, or, or straight ahead? That's the hard part. I think, okay, how far away do I put the stand so I still have a good shot at him? Your thoughts on that? Ooh, I, now, when it comes to distance and that's what our the, the seminars i've done this weekend here and we teach we teach um archery camps we have three camps one is in um, montana another one in iowa another one in illinois we take 50 kids we bring them in and we teach them archery education through the the, the bow hunting education curriculum meaning we teach hunting we do it with bows strictly because insurance would cost me a fortune if i put guns in 50 kids hands but my point with that is we have, we're teaching kids. We're trying to teach them that getting into hunting is about getting close and making an ethical shot. So when we're talking about how close we shoot things, we try to keep them under, I, I like whitetail deer shots, honestly, under 20 yards. Um, I, I can shoot farther than that. And I, for sure, I'm just like everyone else. I like to go out in the yard and shoot a hundred yard arrow, watch it fly. But when it comes to animals, I want to get as close as I can which there's a portion of which can be taught. And then eventually some instinct has to kick in. And that is, when do I draw? When do, because you can't teach all every little aspect because every encounter is different. And so, you know, we're, we're, we probably err on the, the side of being too close sometimes. Um, and, but that's because I think our percentage rate of our shots are, are better because we're that close. And right now, let's take a little uh, break and give Raised Hunting opportunity to tell you where to find them, how to get in touch with them, and how to buy their, their videos because they got they get great uh, videos of their hunt. So the mic's yours. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, raised Honey can be found. And if you type in RaisedHoney.com, it's going to take you to our website, our social media site. Um, we've, we're now just completed our third season on the Outdoor Channel. We're working on season four. Um, if you haven't seen Raised Honey, we, we don't describe it and nor do any of the people that come to our booth and say thank you um, for what we're putting together. It's not a hunting show. And I know that crazy. We're sitting here talking on the White, White Tail Rendezvous with Bruce. Um, it's really not. It's really a, a television show about life and about family. We just happen to do it on the platform of what we absolutely believe is the greatest one that God has ever created. And that is we do it in the outdoors. So we solve those issues that the same people are going out there. We have children that play piano or ballet, 
they're having to figure out how do I get them to do all these things? How do I get their grades up? How do I get through to my kids? We're doing the exact same thing, but we show them how to do it through climbing in a tree stand or getting in a ground blind to hunt turkeys or going out west to hunt elk. Now, when you, when you talk about raised hunting, uh, everybody knows a hunting tradition. I had a hunting tradition started by Otto Knight and Harry Shear, and um, that was my beginning. I mean, those two gentlemen came alongside me, mentored me, and <laughs> to the chagrin of my wife, <laughs> have put me all over North American places that maybe I didn't need to be. <laughs> That's for sure. Let's talk about how your hunting tradition started. Ooh, I, you know, for me, I think that's what makes raised hunting so relatable. Um, Karen and I grew up in Virginia, so I hunted the urban stuff right outside of Washington, D.C. I was the guy that 30 years ago, and I'm giving my age away now, maybe even 32, 33 years ago, I was living in the problem of the urban sprawl. So I would have a place to hunt one year, and then houses might come in, and, and it would push me. At the same time, I knew I didn't belong there. I needed to move other places. So I ended up moving to Arkansas. I learned to hunt the swamp deer where there is no terrain. I mean, it's completely flat and you learn what water level can do or, and, and different things that the deer will live on, whether it's pin oaks floating in the water. Um, and then from there, we ended up in Montana for the last 20 years and we've now settled in Iowa. The, the, the Montana experience taught us what it's like to go off on your own, to, to put a backpack on and go and stay in the woods. Um, you know, for four or five days and hunt elk. And I can tell you, I've stood on a mountain and watched elk walk away and thought I can't go there, which forced me to go to the gym and train because I was like, I'm not doing that anymore. I came too far to not go the rest of the way. So it really, hunting has led me like you, you talked about where it's taken you. The tradition for me started with family, but even my family didn't have the passion and, and that hunting tradition they had the, the original tradition, a big core group gets, gets together and it was fun, you know, every, and we shot whatever, you know, spikes. And, and that's, that's what I still try to teach people today. I live in Iowa, the land of the giants, and, and I never want people to get, uh, think that that's all we shoot. Because I'll tell you right now, I have some kids that come through camp and they come back out and they want to go hunting or we'll take a new, new person hunting. And the rule is shoot whatever makes you excited. I mean, it truly is. If I didn't have those spikes and those forked horns and those does that I shot way back when, I probably wouldn't have the passion that I have today for hunting. So I never want to take that away from anyone. Um, it, it's truly a mission. Hunting's being attacked from every angle, from the news crews, the CNNs and the Fox Newses and all those places to the social media. We, we personally get attacked. And um, our family just feels very strong. I'm super fortunate. I got two boys that are 21 and 16. And they seem to be following in dad's footsteps, at least with the passion of hunting. And so we're white fighting very hard and we want to make a difference. We, we want to see hunting still here for all these kids that I'm watching walk by the front of this truck right now. Let's talk about your wife and women are the fastest growing segment in the outdoors, not just hunting, but fishing, canoeing, biking. I, I saw, I did a sheep hunt last August and I saw more women on the 14ers than I did men. So let's talk about that. And I, I, I hate to talk for my wife because she, she loves to tell people and she loves to get other women involved. But uh, how, how fortunate when, when God blesses people, he may give Michael Jordan the ability to shoot basketball or Tiger Woods the, 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 the ability to swing a club. I guess he gave David Holder the opportunity to go hunting with his family. And, and that is something that I think that is what makes raised hunting so relatable. So many people get it. But I'm not the guy that is looking to go hunting to get away from the family for a week. I want them right there with me. There's nothing, nothing in life I've found that's more exciting than watching them. And so when you add your wife into that mix and she just sees that passion, but she also, because she's a woman, she understands all the things that keep women from wanting to go. And, and we were no different. The boys were young. She's the one that stayed home to watch them more. Then as they got older, we started to take them more. She's the one that was always worried. Are they going to fall out of the tree stand? Are we going to get lost? Um, and then clothing and all the gear that goes along just was not geared toward women. So she's wearing my clothes, shooting my old bow. Now Bear Archery makes bows that, that, that work for women. Under Armour is a, a big partner of ours, and they're making clothing that fits. She's warm. She's comfortable. She can hike. She can go do all the things that we do as men. And she's trying to tell people, tell these other women, men, don't miss this, especially because there's so many men that still do enjoy the outdoors. 
And if you miss that, then you just kind of separate. And, and I think her little trick too, is she tell mothers, especially you will find out more about your kids sitting in a tree stand when no deer are around than you ever will sitting at the kitchen table. I mean, there just isn't time to get that intimate. And all of a sudden, you know, she's coming home and telling me, did you know Warren was doing this? And I'm like, where'd that come from? You know, that came after three hours of not seeing a deer. So it, there's something really, really special about getting women involved. It really is. And I watch you guys uh, work and they're a great team. And, and one thing that Karen has is that she has a special cause. Why don't you share the uh, arrow wrap cause? You know, and, and that one is a family deal, but Karen's the, probably the, she's the leader in it as far as organizing it. A few years ago, a friend of mine, um, I re- we both retired from the fire department in, in uh, um, Arkansas, Searcy, Arkansas. His wife um, be- was diagnosed with breast cancer. And at the point, you know, this is a friend of mine, just like you, Bruce. You have a guy you talk to maybe once a month on the phone, just chit-chat. How's the hunting season going? Mitch calls me, you know, and I could tell immediately something was wrong. And I'm listening to a guy that voice is quivering, and, and he's a, probably the most devout Christian I know. And I could tell that he was leaning on God hard because he really thought he's going to lose his wife. And as I listened to him, you know, what I'm offering at the time is, man, you want to come up and go hunting with me and try to get his mind off of it. And, and, you know, but I don't want to take him away from his wife either. And Karen and I both were like, what could we do? What, what, what is this that we could do to offer something? And so anyhow, the two of us got putting our heads together. And one day I looked down at her arrow and I was like, what if we wrapped an arrow that was solid pink, started to talk to hunters about carrying a pink arrow in their quiver. And, um, so anyhow, then she said, well, can you design it? I, she didn't know how to do that. And I said, I think so. So we came up with a 12, we came up with a pack of it's three 12 inch strips. You could cut them in half and have six arrow wraps to have to wrap a half a quiver of arrows or a, or a half a dozen arrows, or you can just, what we hope people will do is just pick one arrow and put those 12 inch wraps one over top of the other until you wrap the whole arrow in pink. And, um, Karen coordinated the whole thing. We built a commercial last year, put it out on, we built a show as well put it out on the outdoor channel. And, um, we're proud to say that last year we wrote a $5,000 check on behalf of our family and raised hunting to the national breast cancer foundation. And, um, so it's a, and, and I, I'll guarantee you the two of us sitting in this truck know many people because of our age that, that have experienced this, but I can't even, even my kids, when I ask them, you know, the kids that come to camp, every one of them has an aunt, an uncle, um, or some friend in school that's dealing, it's just, it's everywhere. And so we wanted to try to give back. So. Why do you think Iowa, um, has some monster buck, none of the giants and, um, <laughs> it does it folks. If you just walk the halls here, you're going to see some huge deer, the new state record, 283, uh, archery kill, I yep. believe, um, is here. That buck is here. And so when you look at that, no wonder you know, it takes me four years to get <laughs> had an archery tag. We're laughing. I'm crying. But what can I say? So let's talk about the land of the giants. Ooh, I, I, you know, that's a, the contributing factor first would be the, the agriculture, the, 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 the fields, the soybean, the, the corn fields. And then I think it's the genetic of the deer. These deer are big. My, my, my son Warren this year, and you'll see this episode this year, shot the, the largest deer that I know only because I think we might've killed one or two, maybe weight wise that were a little bigger, but we didn't weigh them. This one was official and he was 261 pounds dressed. That is a giant deer. And so therefore the bone structure is larger, but my hat is off to the DNR and how they handle the state. And, and you mentioned four years to draw a tag. They really help these deer get the age structure they need to get to that size because we don't have any gun season inside the rut. And so our gun season doesn't start till December. And that really allows these deer to go out there and do what they normally do for the first two months. They do have an early muzzleload season, which if people don't know, that can be fantastic. It can also be horrible. just depends on how the weather hits. Um, But at the same time, I think those are some of the biggest contributing factors. You have the genes, you have the genetics, and you have an agency overseeing them and doing everything they can. They understand, and Iowa has figured it out, if you have big deer, people will come. Yes, they will. <laughs> so, um, and then I think the last one is you, you roll in all the new nutrients and things that people are able to feed in the food plots, and we're helping these deer. We we plant arrow seed. Um, we got we got several of Robbie's uh, brassica plots and things like that. And I honestly can tell you, 
in the last three years, we've watched some of our deer just on this one particular farm benefit from what we've planted. Yeah, let's give a shout out for Arrow Seed, uh, Devin and, and Robbie Johnson out there in Nebraska. They put out a good product. Yes, there's a lot of people that are in the uh, food plot business. I'll just leave it at that. But Robbie and his crew, they've been in the agricultural business for a really long time. And they send, they sell tons of seed, you know, for agriculture. So they spun off and Robbie's running it and um, couldn't have a nicer guy to work with or a knowledgeable guy in the business. So arrow seed, there you go. Oh, I, I'll add the one part about it that I think that stands them apart. And I, and I shouldn't say that because I don't call all the other ones, but I know for a fact, if you have questions about food plots, I can call them at any time. And I have sent numerous people that have contacted us through our website said, Hey, call this guy over here. He is actually the expert on it. And they answer the phone every time they'll answer every email. They, they want to prove to people that they know what they're doing and they'll do whatever they can to do that. Um, and when you say tons of seed, literally, I mean, they, yeah, they, they handle all of the CRP. We have two farms that, um, that we, that we work with one of which we don't hunt it or anything, just a neighbor. And I mentioned to him, Hey, you ought to talk to these guys cause they were enrolling in a CRP program. And, uh, and sure enough, I got a call from Robbie. He said, Hey, we worked out a deal with them. These people are just ecstatic and the state loves it because they're walk, go out there and the CRP that they're seeing is what they want. Um, and it, then again, now, now, now we get into what I really believe. And that is, it's no more about just deer. It's now about birds. It's about rabbits. It's about all the other things you created habitat for. And those are the things that are going to work in all of our favor long-term. And that's, I'll just pl- put a plug out for Colorado Department of Wildlife, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, where I come from. And because we manage the herd of elk for specific, um, management goals it enhances the life of every single critter out there it could be from a marmot to a chipmunk it, it really doesn't matter when they do it right for one animal then it spills down for all the rest and guess who benefits everyone if you're a birder wouldn't it be nice to go to a place that you know at some time of year there's going to be birds there why because it's food covering water yep. yeah no and i used to live we like i mentioned we lived out west and so we have lived in the debacle of the wolf issue. And now the, the one that's going on is grizzlies. And I know we could get into a whole. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, another five it, hours. It, it is. <laughs> and, um, but anyhow, you just find that hunters are passionate about what we, what we look at, what we believe in. And that's the thing that I, I hope that we are getting out with the Raised Hunting, the television show. Hunters are not killers. Hunters are probably the best conservation tool that this planet has ever seen. When we are allowed to hunt these animals, we, uh, we afford in dollars that we spend to do other things to replenish the same thing that we're taking. It's a renewable resource. And, man, it's a fantastic way. But, but beyond that, it's a fantastic way to reach out there and, and preserve this earth. But, but even more than that, we want to preserve that tradition and that heritage that goes with the family. And I'm just going to lay that out. Hunters... Um, there's something called Pitt and Robinson money. So sales tax money goes back to each state and each state uses it. I would challenge you, um, the people who just aren't hunters at all, but you go out and you view an elk, you view, um, a swan, you view geese, anything that you view has been supported by those funds. And the people that write the checks are like Dave and I, like thousands of people that come through the show. And we're real people in real places, and there's nothing really special. Yeah, Dave's got a great show, but he's he's family minded. And when you look at all this, it's a heck of an industry. When I was at ATA, forty seven billion dollar industry, that'll get the attention of a lot of people. Absolutely, it does. You know, and and but but I think just so many times people see a furry animal and it gets killed. It's going to get killed or it's going to die. And, and when you see an animal and it, when you live out West, then you get to see what a hard winter can do, or you get to see what disease can do or see one taken down by another predator, not a human. And, um, the bow and arrow and the gun are the most effective tools for taking out an animal there possibly is. And, and so, I mean, here's the thing we have been talking, we get, we get the, the anti hunters, attack our pages constantly. And, and all we want is a fair fight. All we want is, and, and I say, I shouldn't even say fight because it's not a fight. I would love to have more non-hunters 
approach us and say, hey, let's let's debate this. Let's talk about it. Because I do think that I can bring them um, from a family platform, from a father's platform, and from a conservation and a hunter's platform that, you know what, let, let me show you the other side of this. Let me show you the real side. And, and all it is, it's just been slanted and it's been tainted and it's not fair. And, and we just want a, to be able to give our word into that. And, and I do think when, if people would give us just a couple minutes, they would realize how good, how good we are at what we do. And that was a little break here at uh, Iowa Deer Classic. Yes, we are sitting in a $68,000 trick out Dodge. And a lot of people want to take a look at this. Yeah, they, they think we bought it. They think we're driving <laughs> off in this thing. They're trying to talk to us before we leave. <laughs> and Dave and I didn't buy this. Dave <laughs> wants to buy it and wrap it. But I, yeah. I said my checkbook's a little light. <laughs> let's go back and let's talk about right now um, the youth part of your business what you're doing there. Oh boy. I, the youth part of our business really is, uh, it, it, it's raised at full draw and, and raised at full draw are the archery camps we offer. And I mentioned earlier, they're only archery camps because they are, that's the way insurance. If we took, we, we take 50 kids, we keep them for four days and three nights. They stay in tents. We feed them well, but we teach them the bow hunter education curriculum. So at the end of camp, they actually get certified. They're nationally, nationally recognized in any state. And so what ends up happening is these kids come in and on Thursday they can bring their own equipment or we have equipment for them. So only thing that they need to have is a sleeping bag and a tent and, and a toothbrush and a towel because we're going to make them take a shower. But uh, these kids show up on a Thursday. We keep them for the next four days. On Sunday, we're all done. Um, but they go through stations. And so just like what you see in your hunter education where they'll have a, a field day and they spend like an hour and a half with the kids, we end up with 17 hours of hands-on curriculum with these kids. Wow. They'll, they'll shoot about a thousand arrows over those four days at 3D targets, at static targets. We talk about shot angles. We talk about distance. We talk about how to, how to judge distance. We talk about camouflage, anything that you can think about to do with hunting. But I think the reason that our camps resonate so well is as instructors, we can get up there and talk to the kids all we want. But then you hear the kids, we let them go out on the 3D course and we have people monitor them, but we don't watch over their shoulder the whole time. We'll let some of the better, the, the better shooters go with kids that aren't as good as shooters. And man, you watch kids teaching kids. So then we find that we're not even, it's not even about hunting anymore. We're teaching kids how to be in charge and be leaders and be mentors. And, and then by the fourth day, I have kids crying and everything because they're having to go home. Um, and, or maybe they're crying cause they finally got their phone back. Cause we take their phone from them on the first day. Um, just, but we give it back to them. We do want them to take photos. We give it to them a few times, but it, we, we, we really want them to focus on what we're doing. And I'll be honest, it's 14 years now that I've been doing this four years as raised at full draw. I don't think I've ever had a single kid come up and ask for their phone. I really don't. And I think that's because we keep them so busy with what they're doing. So when I said that they get their instructor um or they get their certification we don't sit down there's no classroom it's all done in the field with the bow in their hand that's great and that's part of our industry and it, you've heard over 360 people on my show and one thing that, that commonality runs through the whole show is, is simply 99.9 percent .9 of these people are giving back in one way or another and some people choose different ways but it makes our industry uh, a very small family. It's a huge industry, but just like Dave and I will we'll start developing a relationship because we're at common ground. And a good friend of mine told me a long time ago, he said, Bruce, when you're sitting around the fireplace, when you're um, sitting around the campfire, when you're playing pinochle poker, whatever in the cabin, it doesn't matter who, what, and where we all have common ground because we're out there hunting. We're out there, uh, enjoying what God's created for us and we enjoy it. And so to the people out there that are scratching heads and say, what's the big deal about this? Find some friends, find somebody that's done it before and just go spend a night in the woods. You'll be surprised what happens. Well, what they'll be surprised is when you start to look and listen and, and I learn more, I try, I teach seminars and I talk a lot. Um, I learn way more about animals, about nature, about my family, about me. When I stop talking, when I'm just sitting there, not saying a word, you'll hear things you never envisioned that you would hear. 
you'll see things that you would never see because the average person's not going to get up at 4.30 in the morning to go be there, be sitting in the woods when the sun comes up. And you can watch a completely different contrast from animals that are there in the dark. And then an hour later, the sun comes up and it's just different. Um, so, it, and, and I agree with you. If they've never experienced it, you can't explain it. And so, so you just have to encourage them. Go with someone. Don't be afraid, you know. Um, life is too short to not try, to not go do those things. And, and that's what I've taught my boys forever, that, you know, that this is the next mountain might be the next thing that none of us ever expected to see. Well, we just got a few minutes now to um, wrap up the show. Why don't you just give shout outs to your family, to your sponsors, whoever you get the mic for about a minute or two. <laughs> okay. Well, that this is easy because I guess the number one shout out, maybe the only one I should do at this time is today is March 5th, uh, 2017. And that means tomorrow. So I think I can safely say I can avoid her for the rest of the day to make sure this <laughs> happens. But, uh, my wife, Karen and I will celebrate 25 years of marriage. Wow. And, and that's really special at this day and age. It's special to us. Um, you know, and, and yet we're, we're not getting to go anywhere. We will do something, but it'll have to be at a different time because we feel that passionate about what we're doing here that we wanted to make sure we came out and these people are here and they're not going to change the Iowa Deer Classic when the dates are, um, you know, for us and we get it. And we do think it's that important that we come out and shake hands with everyone and, and talk with them. But, um, you know, some of the biggest, biggest, uh, supporters for our camps and, and for us has been Realtree and Under Armour and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and, and the National Wild Turkey Federation. I got a huge heart for all those conservation organizations because as we develop Raised at Full Draw, I understand how much work has gone into what they're doing. And when you hear them talk, of, they, they just throw out, oh, we've saved a million acres. Like it's no big deal. Man, there's been a lot of work on those people's part. So if you're not involved in those organizations, you really need to look at doing that. But big shout out to Bruce because I had never met Bruce until here. And uh, I've enjoyed the last 20 minutes or whatever. And, and I'm watching these people circle our truck. So I'm, I'm really <laughs> thinking, they're thinking I'm really famous, you know, so. <laughs> they're taking our picture now. Yeah. So the Whitetail <laughs> Rendezvous, I think, is going to be around for a while. As long as Bruce wants to do it, it should be great. So I appreciate you having me on here. Well, and on behalf of thousands of listeners, we're over 120,000 downloads on iTunes and my website. I hit 360 uh, shows. And, and folks, it's a labor of love because um, my hunting tradition goes back 50 years and a couple of gentlemen that took me under their wing and said, you need to go hunting. And it's just, they saw it in me and, and, and away we went. And I've been fortunate, blessed to hunt a lot of places. And the thing I like most about um, Whitetail Rendezvous, I get to meet people like you. And I'll say it again, real people in real places. Now, there's a lot of other stuff out there. There's clutter. I call it clutter. But when you get and sit in a nice Dodge truck and spend 20 minutes with a guy and you learn something about him, he learned something about you, and we both leave uh, better men. And so, Absolutely. Dave Holder, thank you so much for raised hunting. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. On the next episode, we're going to be visiting with Philip Vanderpool. Philip is the owner, director, and producer of The Virtual TV. You're not going to want to miss this. Uh, Philip shared a lot of secrets, a lot of in and outs. He used to be with Hunter Specialties. Now he's off on his own, uh, producing some great content. Philip Vanderpool, The Virtual TV, is up next. We welcome Philip Vanderpool to the show today. Philip hails from Arkansas, and one thing about Philip you might not know is that he's taken over 30 turkeys with his bow. That's right, folks. He's quite a turkey slayer. Even more special than that, he spent a lot of time at Hunter Specialties, where he's a cameraman, and he did a lot of work and was on a lot of great hunts for whitetails. All in all, Philip brings the virtues that everybody has in the outer doors to TV with his new show, The Virtual TV. He invites us all to come, to watch, and to bring the hunting tradition alive through virtual TV. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.